We're going to have a small audience today. How you doing, Cormac? Thanks for joining us today. And uh, to everybody that decided to join the webinar, really appreciate you coming in here to another Rocket Dollar webinar. Um, today, we're going to have the CEO and founder of Diamond Standard Fund, Cormac McKinney. He's coming to us from New York. And we're going to talk about some hard assets put into your IRA portfolio. So, Cormac, hey, why don't you hey, go ahead and you. Great. Take it away. Well, um, so we're here to talk about something new and interesting in the world of alternatives. I guess it's, a, it's an alternative alternative. Uh, and it's an asset that everybody's familiar with, but no one could ever invest in, and, and that's diamonds. And the the problem with diamonds is that every diamond's a little bit different. And so you would never be able to have price discovery. You can never trade at a market price. Uh, and the friction when you tried to buy and sell diamonds, you would basically buy at retail and and sell below wholesale. You could never make money that way. And uh, what we realized the key challenge was that we had to make diamonds fungible. And like a gold bar, it's a standard unit that can be traded on an exchange. Diamonds is a little bit more challenging. We had to create a way to standardize them. And our breakthrough, which a lot of people are familiar with, are our diamond standard coins. As you can see, the diamonds are inside and diamond standard bars, which are larger diamonds, higher dollar value. And the breakthrough is that these two bars are equivalent. These are what's deemed by the CFTC as good for delivery. They're approved to settle futures contracts, uh, for example. And as a spot commodity, these trade at a single market price. You can trade them on an exchange. And uh, this has unlocked a, a large asset class. Diamonds are actually worth about 1.2 trillion. And now that they're in this tradable mark to market uh, form, you can now add them to your portfolio. And in the last uh, two and a half years since we launched this, Diamonds have performed very well. They've actually outperformed gold by about 20% during that period. And now in partnership with Rocket Dollar, this commodity is accessible to an IRA account for the very first time. And the way we do that is by, we've created a fund called Diamond Standard Fund, which is now available to IRA investors. Whereas individual commodities like diamonds or gold generally are not accessible to IRAs. So that's what we've unlocked. Yeah, definitely diamonds specifically. And not everybody knows this, but it took our team a while to get involved with, with your team. And that's primarily because the fear our leadership had with allowing the, the Diamond Standard Fund on the platform and having it in a retirement account, because you definitely can't own diamond as an asset, diamond as an asset specifically in your retirement account. That's right. We actually partnered with a, a world-class asset manager, Horizon Kinetics. They run about 10 billion and they really specialize in things that are inflation resistant. And it's because of that, they found us, uh, first of all, they invested in our company, but then they we joined this uh, together to create this fund that adds to their suite of inflation protection assets. The most famous of which is INFL which is an ETF they launched on the on the NYSE uh, about two years ago, which has mm. performed very, very well. But now uh, we, th we see diamonds expanding into a lot more investors' portfolios. Great. So when we think of inflation resistant, a lot of people will think of something like um, tips, right? Or uh, maybe some floating rate funds. And right now with the current environment, there's the, the recession, being thrown around all over the place. So we do have investors, and I do know investors who are worried about inflation running away and a hyperinflationary environment. So how would you approach, I guess, investing with the, the Diamond Standard Fund versus what we're currently looking at? Well, there's, yeah, inflation is a key issue. And um, if you look at commodities over the last year. Last year, commodities returned about 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. And it's when you have that period of inflation, 
you very often tip off a commodity super cycle. And that's where commodities tend to trade above their, their longer term moving average for as long as 10 years or even 15 years. And I think it's, it's absolutely clear that we're beginning that commodity super cycle. Uh, commodities are up tremendously. The diamond, diamond commodity is up. Gold was actually a bit resistant. I was surprised, and a lot of people were surprised, that gold was actually flat to down uh, in much of 2022. Now it's starting to, to move back in the right direction. And that's a lot of because of the actions of sovereign wealth funds, I think. But commodities in general tend to do well during periods of inflation. And a lot of institutional investors, and I spend most of my days speaking with institutional investors, a lot, all of them are moving into inflation resistant assets and commodities are becoming a larger component where they used to be two, 3%, they're becoming five, six, 7% of a lot of institutional portfolios. That's, that's impressive. So I understand you brought some slides. Let's uh, take a look at the, the slides that you have and we'll yeah. get a little bit deeper. So inflation is, is kind of um, a side benefit, inflation protection of, of diamonds as an, as an asset class. We don't want to just keep up with inflation. We want to perform very well as an investment category. Although, you know, we don't really, we don't have an opinion on diamonds. We're not promoting them. We're making them accessible and trying to unlock them as an investment asset. But if you look at the big picture for commodities and precious metals in general, the very interesting fact is that investors already own at least 15% of every precious metal. And with gold, that's 30%. Uh, but for platinum and silver, that's 17 to almost 20%. Diamonds, as I mentioned, have been left out of the financialization. There's no diamond ETFs or futures or uh, you know, funds right. until now but now they're just starting. But we think that diamonds will go from 2%, that's the amount investors hold today, towards 15%. And our investment thesis is, is really very simple. As investors start to accumulate positions in diamond, and by investors, I mean the Black Rocks of the world, the State Streets, mm -hmm. PIMCOs, as, as they start to build positions, that's gonna drive diamond prices up uh, potentially significantly, and that will drive a large part of the demand. We've already gotten approvals for a lot of those different financial products. We launched two spot commodities, the, the coin and the bar. These are fungible. These trade on the Diamond Standard Exchange. So as I've mentioned, people are able to buy and sell these uh, with, with very, very low friction. And we have actually received approval to list a futures contract, mm -hmm. and that's in development to list on the CME. So with gold, with silver futures, you're soon going to have diamond futures. That unlocks a very large new segment of investors, which are basically all of the asset managers who can't, actually they cannot buy diamonds today or the diamond commodities because they need what's called a national market price to uh, use for their funds. They have to mark to market with a national market price. But as soon as the futures and options are live, that's gonna unlock a much, much larger segment of investors. But over time, we're looking forward to a real inflection point, which is diamonds will be added to the commodity indices hmm. for the very first time. And uh, there's a lot of pensions and endowments that invest, like I said, 5% or 7% in commodities. They're really tracking the index. So once diamonds are in the commodity index, you're going to see a lot of those uh, sovereign wealth funds, for example, allocating to diamond. And that in turn will drive the uh, market price up, benefiting everyone who bought in early. Fantastic. Uh, we did have a question. We had a question roll in. Uh, just asking if the diamond fund is a hedge fund or if it's considered private equity. It's a un, it's a Reg D 506C mm -hmm. unlisted fund. Uh, we will be listing it on uh, a an ATS or on the OTCQX in a few months. So it's considered a it's um, 
you know, in SEC terms, it is a private equity, um, although the asset itself is a commodity. By putting it in a fund and registering it under Form D, it does become a security. And uh, but it's not a hedge fund; it's a single asset private equity fund. Right. And as far as we're concerned, we consider it a securitized asset because you filed it with the SEC, and obviously that's what makes it uh, accessible in a retirement account. That's right. That's exactly right. So, yeah, tell us a little bit more. So a lot of people ask, how do you make this commodity? What makes it fair? What makes it fungible? And, and, and how come I'm able to buy the diamonds from you and still sell them at the spot price? Whereas normally people believe when they buy diamonds and try to sell them, they're always going to take a huge haircut. So it's an interesting process. We built the world's first electronic diamond exchange. And we don't have any opinion on the prices of diamonds. We simply bid on literally millions of different diamonds and we force price discovery. So we actually have eight intake offices around the world in all of the diamond centers like India and Tel Aviv and Dubai, uh, Hong Kong, where we buy diamonds, we bid on them until we price discover and then we pay COD. And we're generally buying diamonds globally from the very first people that cut them. And we consolidate the diamonds and we bring them all to New York where we have our, we're now building our second assembly facility. Mm. So basically we're sealing the diamonds in this bar and we're optimizing them. So every bar is the same, but we're sealing them at cost. And unlike diamonds you may buy from a jewelry store, they haven't been through five or six hands adding markup every time. So we seal them at cost. Then our, we, we're an agency. We provide them to our clients and then they're able to sell them. So the way we buy these diamonds is we buy about 94% of all the different types of diamonds you'll see in a jewelry store. I'm talking about the different carat weights, the different colors, the different clarities. We bid on li literally 94% of the different types. And we're buying from over 180 members of our exchange. So we have on average a million diamonds per week that are offered to us and we buy them by bidding and we're forcing price discovery. Right. So the way that looks and the best way I have to explain that is each one of these little purple spots is a bid. And what we're bidding on is every different type of diamond. And if you ever bought a diamond, you notice that as they get larger, their price goes up exponentially. Or if a diamond becomes flawless or more towards colorless, their price goes up along this nonlinear curve. We have, we have no algorithms. We have no pricing model. We simply bid on mm -hmm. every possible type of diamond until someone somewhere in the world says yes. But we don't buy everything on, in un, unlimited amounts. What we're buying is what's called a, st a statistically valid sample where we have to buy the same pattern of diamonds, the same frequency of D color. So if you take a look at every, every diamond we buy is public. And if you look at the samples today, the sample in 10 years, the sample two years ago, they all had the same frequency of E color. And it was it was 7.32% every time. I made that up, but whatever the mm -hmm. frequency is, it's always the same. And that's how we can prove that the samples are all equivalent. They're all statistically equal. And then the last step is once we have a, a valid sample, we have a, a real significant breakthrough in computer science, which is how do you optimize that and that's basically breaking up all those diamonds into the coins and bars so that every coin itself is a statistical sample, but every coin contains small, medium, and large, mm -hmm. and, they, and it matches that same curve. That whole process is regulated by the Bermuda Monetary Authority, and it's also audited by Deloitte. And mm -hmm. it's because of that foundation, we've now gotten three regulatory approvals um, saying that our commodity is fair, reliable, and, and good for delivery 
in different countries. So it goes without saying, if an investor wanted to do this on their own, it'd be relatively impossible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, how can you possibly do that? It takes the law of large numbers. It's because we're buying t- at least 10,000 diamonds a week that we're able to make the statistics work. Mm-hmm. And it's because of our, you know, uh, our ability to do international customs and consolidated shipping that we, and we pay COD, that brings the cost down and that benefits the investors. Right. So we did have another question roll in, kind of a hot take, but maybe not so much in the diamond industry. Asking it about De Beers, who is famous for keeping diamonds off the market when prices weaken, how will the value of diamonds get realized when, while there is a cartel? Yeah, so that's that's a great example of a, of a myth that we have to bust. Now that used to be true, <laughs> and uh, but De Beers actually got broken up about twenty years ago, and they control less than twenty percent of the supply. So that's not much of a monopoly, and um, they've been a public company for twenty years, which means they have audited financials. We know that they're in what their inventory is twenty years. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely false that they hold back when prices fall. It's uh, because they usually don't even own the diamonds that they're selling. They have distribution agreements for the mines, which very often are owned by the African countries. So De Beers is just the marketing agent. They have no right to hold back the inventory. And on general, in general, they have about 90 days supply, regardless of what happens to price. So that monopoly was really very successfully broken up. And, and now there's a, a lot more competition. Mm. The, the c- cartel really does not exist. Good to know. Uh, what does liquidity look like if someone were to invest in your fund, for example? Well, so the fund itself is not very liquid. So it's really designed for a long-term investor. You're, th- it's not a fund if you're going to trade in and out. Now, if you want to trade in and and out, you don't use your IRA and you can buy these commodities on the spot market. Mm -hmm. You can trade those 24 hours a day. And, you know, there's right now, you know, a million dollars of liquidity on our exchange. So if you want to be a trader, you trade the spot. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a holder of the longer term asset waiting for the futures to get approved, that'll drive the price. Waiting for the ETF to be approved that'll really drive the price and waiting for commodity diamonds to be added to the commodity index. That's the third leg of the inflection point. Um, It's potential. The diamond prices are up five to seven times. That's what happened with uranium. For example, Mm. it's the first uranium fund got listed. Uranium prices doubled with within seven months. So that's what we expect. So the fund doesn't have liquidity. You're, you're locked up for one year, but then you could trade your shares in the fund on on the ATS where they're, where they're being listed. Well, that's good to know. Um, and aside from that, I mean, if you're going to have it in an IRA anyway, people shouldn't really expect that kind of liquidity because it's a long-term asset and it's a long-term strategy that's when right. you're using your retirement account money. We're looking at a minimum five years, right? right. Uh, in most cases, you're looking at 10 or 20 to build that retirement account. I would target five years at minimum. Uh, mm-hmm. I think over that period of time, we're highly confident that the ETF will be live. We know that the, the futures are already approved, so that's much shorter term. Uh, but it's the globalization of this asset class into multiple vehicles, ex- exchange traded commodities in Europe and around the world. That demand is gonna drive the value of, of diamonds up quite significantly. But the other thing I'll mention is even if we don't, ever list any diamond products like an ETF, diamond prices are going up without our help. And that's because the supply of diamonds is falling. Uh, And the reason for that is that they haven't discovered any new diamond mines in over 20 years. The last mines discovered were up in far Northern Canada. So the supply is falling by about three to 4% per year. But at the same time, the demand for jewelry has been rising by two or three percent a year. Um, and so you have a mismatch. You have falling supply and rising demand. 
that's going to drive up prices. Mm -hmm. The main source of that demand is China. There are a lot more jewelry consumers. So jewelry demand in China is growing by about uh, over $2 billion a year. I had another question pop in, which is what I wanted to ask too. So the, what other, in, I guess, what other industries, manufacturing oil and gas, use diamonds uh, for practical, practical purposes? Uh, not many. So I'm sure you've all heard of, about the synthetic diamonds, which have been uh, gaining ground. Yep. So synthetic diamonds are, are you know, exciting. They're basically, you can grow them in a lab with extreme pressure and heat. And the first application was for jewelry. And the problem is that it turned out to be pretty cheap to make these. And the values of synthetic diamonds have fallen by over 90%. So it's basically a, in the wholesale market, a synthetic diamond is worth 5% of what a natural diamond is. But then the problem is if you try to sell your synthetic diamond, it's worthless. Mm. And so we haven't seen any drop in the demand for natural diamonds. As I showed you that chart, natural diamond demand has grown every year since th synthetics have been available and that's projected to continue. But there's a bunch of new applications that they're finding, especially in the computer chip world to use synthetic diamonds. Now, historically you use natural diamonds for things like drill bits and, um, you know, uh, I did. Yeah. but it turns out that you would have to basically sweep up all the scraps and then refine them and sort them to the size you need, like the size of the grit. Turns out that's a great application for synthetic diamonds. And so the applications for natural diamonds in industry have actually fallen. And that's where synthetic diamonds have been uh, very successful. We think that natural diamonds now have two use cases. Obviously jewelry, by far 98% today is jewelry, but the investment use cases is growing like it is for gold. And diamonds are very special because they're so small. They're the only natural resource that, I mean, this is $5,000, this is $50,000. They can be sealed with electronics and decentralized. So one big application of the diamond standard commodities is that we're using them as the asset behind digital currencies. And that asset can be delivered if you return the currency. So we see that as the, as the largest and fastest growing segment of diamond use. That's a good point. And obviously that's going to weigh a lot less than $50,000 of gold bars. That's right. Easier gold, to transport. But beyond the weight and transport, because the electronics are in the bar, that's a wireless um, computer chip, you can audit them instantly. You can't do that with gold. Mm -hmm. And if you seal gold in plastic, you have no idea if it's real. Diamonds you can see. So you can still authenticate the diamond. So it's the only resource on earth that works as a digital asset as well as a physical commodity. That's incredible. Well, goes without saying what you guys have done there is remarkable. And we're very excited to be partnering with you. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I, well, the other thing a lot of, is, you know, a lot of, you know, sophisticated investors, they're very interested in the correlation. Mm -hmm. And so that's another aspect, you know, with institutional investors, especially. That's the other th thing that's, that's really pretty incredible about diamonds is partly because they've never been financialized. They're totally uncorrelated. And I think, you know, maybe, you know, I, I spent decades, not decades, I spent years as a portfolio manager mm -hmm. for Paul Tudor Jones and for Millennium. And so I, as a quantitative trader, I researched all the correlations of all the assets. I've never seen one like diamonds. Here, for example, is a correlation table from Bloomberg for 20 years. And you'll see that gold and silver have a 0.76 correlation. They move together quite you know consistently. However, gold to diamonds have a 
a near zero correlation. Exactly, it's, it's near negative, slightly mm -hmm. negative correlation. But across that row, you see that diamonds have 0.0, .0 correlation, really to almost everything, 0 0.12 to bonds. That means that this asset diversifies no matter what portfolio you have, it adds a it adds a diversification benefit. And since it has positive return, it also adds a positive sharp uh, to the sharp ratio. And that's been over 20 years, but also for two years. In the last two years, diamonds have remained 0.0, .0 correlated. So a lot of our investors are people who invest in gold. Gold really hasn't performed very well. It's held its value. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of investors who own gold are adding 10%, 20% diamond. And that's had a very positive impact on, on their portfolios. And you see it at, in the history at any times of crisis, diamonds have dramatically outperformed gold and stocks as um, this kind of uh, uh, positive returning asset in times of, of distress. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of the, deeper level of institutional insight. Yeah, I appreciate that. We do get a lot of calls about gold, people wanting to buy gold in their IRA. Uh, so would like to know if, you know, how many people would be purchasing diamonds instead of gold following the webinar, obviously. I think it's both. If, uh, you know, most, we don't, I don't think you need to be either or. Mm -hmm. uh, it's if you believe in inflation protection and having a hedge, um, and having something that's that has upside, diamond, uh, diamonds are more of that, they have the downside protection and the speculative upside. Mm -hmm. Gold is going to be your downside protection. So I think a mix of both is actually what's prudent. That's a good point. So almost like a barbell strategy. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I had another question for you, but it slips, slips me right now. Um, I think I had to do... Um, it was, uh, was something about precious metals, but. Yeah, I mean, the key for us is that diamonds are now joining precious metals as a viable asset. I, I didn't, I don't think I mentioned it. Diamonds are actually worth more than all precious metals combined, except for gold. So diamonds are worth more than all the silver, platinum, palladium, and rhodium combined. Mm. And that's going to make them a major component of the commodity index when they get added to it. So that's going to really drive the market adoption. Great. Uh, now I know what I was going to say. It had nothing to do with precious metals. I was going to say it's um, in re relation to a 60-40 portfolio, right? Which is sort of gone by the wayside. Yeah, I was going to say, what's that? <laughs> right, right. Nobody really pays attention to that too much anymore. Uh, no, alternatives are, obviously, you know, alternatives have taken off in the last 20 years. Right. And what we're doing now is like kind of alternative alternatives, uh, but really unlocking a huge asset class that everybody's familiar with, but that was always out of reach. We think that's a that's a unique opportunity versus things that are a little more esoteric, like mm -hmm. cars or wine or, you know, art. Collectibles in general. Which yeah. are good. Those are good diversifiers, but it's hard to, uh, it's hard to see a consistent strategy whereas diamonds are just it's another silver that's suddenly available and right. uh, you know what to do with silver right uh, and of course if you paired it up with you know other alternatives like real estate in your portfolio or uh, maybe some pre-ipos or something like that then obviously you can have a, a fairly well diversified portfolio with alternatives yeah yeah the key um, I, I learned is buy low sell high yeah, that uh, I try to follow that, right? I think I'm just back holding now. But uh, oh, Jeffrey Mueller said hello, Cormac. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you. All right. So uh, I really don't have too many other questions for you. And if there are no other questions from the audience, then we can uh, close shop and make sure to send this out to everybody who weren't able to attend. All right. Well, thank you. It was great to be here with you. Just to have a, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, so if anybody is interested in more information about Diamond Standard, uh, please listen to the podcast that 
Cormac was on with our CEO, Henry Yoshida, the Rocket Your Dollar podcast.